the far right in the USA consists of, of different parts. Um, one part is the part that's, that now gets a lot of attention these days, which is kind of the most militant or militia based right. There is also the, the conservative movement in the USA and that has an extreme element to it as well. In terms of uh, the, the extreme militia right, that, um, that was a part of, 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 of American history that was um, uh, exemplified by things like the Ku Klux Klan. In the 1920s and 1930s, there was a rise of the Ku Klux Klan, especially in the Northern states, places like Michigan and so forth. Um, and they stayed active uh, into the 1930s on, and they were important at the level of national politics. However, after 1930, after the rise of the New Deal in the USA, there was very little um, uh, influence by this extreme right in national politics, in regional politics a little bit. Uh, but between the 1930s and 2015, uh, there, they were what we call the fringe of American politics and, and, and not involved in national questions. That changed with Donald Trump's um, campaign for the presidency. And it changed because at the level of presidential politics, essentially someone was speaking their language, which was the kind of anti-immigrant uh, scapegoating language that Trump used in his um, campaign and has continued to use in his presidency. Beyond the militia right, there is a long-standing conservative right in America. Uh, this conservatism ro arose in reaction to the New Deal, the 1930s um, program of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, which came out of uh, uh, the Great Depression in the USA, starting in 1933. Um, and this, the, the New Deal created things like social security and the legalization of unions in the USA and it provoked an extreme backlash from um, essentially from the most conservative elements of American industry. And they continue, that, that tendency continued for many years and uh, was forever trying to uh, influence or take over the Republican party. To some extent, their, their greatest success came in 1980 with the, with the election of Ronald Reagan, and they developed a voice within the Reagan coalition and Republican orthodoxy uh, included their notions of what a free market is and, and uh, questions of, of low taxation and attempting to cut back the welfare state. But in, <clears throat> with the election of Obama in 2008, that uh, ideology, which, which um, the conservative movement reflected Republican orthodoxy, but was much more extreme about it instead of trying to um, cut back on the welfare state. The idea was to get rid of it, for example. Um, so that ideology after the election of Obama connected itself to right-wing populism in the USA and created 
the Tea Party. The Tea Party that was very influential in American politics throughout the Obama administration. And during the latter part of the Obama administration, the Tea Party populists began moving from the ideology of right wing free market extremism toward uh, anti immigrant American first, America first nationalism, which meant that they moved from Republican Party regulars and orthodoxy toward the novelty of Trumpian ideology. Trump starts running for presidency in 2015 for the 2016 election. Um, when he starts running for president in, in the USA, there um, are what are called the presidential primaries and that each party gets to choose its um, candidate for, for presidency by a system of primary elections, state by state primary elections. Um, Trump came up against, I think, 16 other candidates, all of whom, or most of whom were well-known figures in the Republican Party. All 15 or 16 other candidates were in some measure in favor of what was called at the time comprehensive immigration reform which was the idea that the Republican Party in the USA where the demography of this country is changing such that um, minorities like black people and Latinos and especially Latinos because that was growing um, seem to be rejecting the Republican Party in favor of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party regulars um, all were for trying to have an opening toward immigrants and Latinos. And they called this um, comprehensive immigration reform. All of those candidates on one side. On the other side is Donald Trump who uh, has paid attention to the populist right on media and so forth in preparation to run for the presidency. And he has understood that the populist right has moved from free market ideology to anti-immigrant ideology. And he became the ex most extreme um, uh, at, uh, spokesperson for that point of view it's expressed in one, um, his argumentation that immigrants were bringing crime and rape and, and, and chaos and disorder and were responsible for the disorder in the USA. That's, that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, he proposed to build a wall on the southern border to Mexico. Um, all of this galvanized the Republican populist base, which is the largest voting base of the Republican party. And by winning their support, he wound up winning the Republican nomination against these 16 others, which is an extraordinary achievement, and then went on to win the general election. In so doing, he transformed the Republican party which from at least 1980 until 2015 had stood for um, uh, neoconservative foreign policy, which um, he, Trump argued against. It stood for globalization, which um, Trump also was against. It stood for international trade agreements. Trump was against that. Um, and so the Republican parties, and there were other aspects, there was the pillars, the ideological pillars of the Republican party 
were flipped on their head and they became what, what the Republican party under Trump came to stand for quite resembled the um, far right policies, par parties in Europe, which had uh, for years been uh, on the edges of, um, of power uh, in places like France where, where um, uh, the Front National had, had, uh, um, uh, had a serious run at the presidency of France in the, in the 1990s and, and would again in, 20, in, in or 2015, 2016, around there. Um, but none of those parties had yet come to power. And what Trump did was not only turn the Republican Party more or less into something ideologically similar to these parties, but he kind of leapfrogged all those parties in Europe by becoming the first one to actually get to the highest office in, in, in the land. And so he, as I say, he kind of leapfrogged over all the others and became um, a beacon for many of the other uh, similar parties in Europe, some of which, especially in Eastern Europe, have come to power. Um, I'm thinking of, of Hungary and, and Poland. There's also the Brexit election, um, which had similar dimensions. And, um, and one can go on and on and on. Uh, in Italy, Salvini uh, becoming part of the uh, the government in uh, 2017, I think it was. Um, so uh, in, in short, Trump transformed the party, the Republican party into something very different than it had been before. And the question right now in the USA is if Trump does not win the election in November, what direction does the Republican Party take post Donald Trump? Identity politics has been a phrase in the USA for many years, a couple of decades. And generally what it used to mean or what it still means uh, to some extent was the political project of minority groups and women, groups like Latinos, Blacks, uh, gays, who um, were fighting to, to develop um, political representation and political power. I, I, I would use the analogy of uh, American power as a table in which people have seats. And so identity politics, Blacks, Latinos, gays, women, etc. Identity politics was about trying to get a seat at the table. In contrast, what um, we, are, we have seen um, first with the Tea Party in the USA and then more so with, with the Trump movement was a counter version of identity politics in the USA. It was the politics of the populist American right who perceived these other groups um, who are defined by multiculturalism and feminism, uh, which often, for example, in Europe is called things like cultural Marxism. In the USA, it's often called political correctness. But the perception it was to go back to the analogy of seats at the table that um, American populist right 
often defined by things like um, Christian fundamentalism or Christian or ev evangelical politics and other variations um, perceive themselves as being displaced from the table. So the classic identity movements in the USA were about being deprived of, um, of a seat at the table or deprived of power. Whereas the identity movements on the right, which arose, as I said, with the Tea Party and then Trump, um, were about feeling dispossessed from their seat at the table. And dispossession is a more acid emotion than deprivation and has given rise to the harsh edge one sees of uh, the radical or um, of the right in, in the USA uh, 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 at this level. Under Trump, the um, the well before Trump, let let us say um, the the person who most anticipated Trump in American politics was Sarah Palin, who ran for vice president under John McCain in two thousand and eight, and she was very much a, a populist figure uh, in the same way Trump was, who would who would inspire rallies and so forth. And she gave a, a title to the, uh, um, her, her followers and that was quote unquote, the real Americans. And as the populace moved into the phase where they were no longer talking about things like uh, <clears throat> free market, politics, opposition to things like Obamacare, health insurance in the USA, and toward um, uh, anti-immigration nationalism. With that development, increasingly the sense of real American became associated with being white. This played into the hands of longtime um, neo-Nazi and uh, Ku Klux Klan groups and, um, and created, uh, they became part of the uh, Trump coalition. Uh, American right-wing populists now identify as being white and, and sometimes being white and Christian in a way that um, is more explicit. And I think more explicit even in their own minds that to, to identify as being white than, than it had been before. It is more central to identity. In the hands of the militant right, the militia right, that leads to an ideology of white nationalism. Um, and, and that's, there still is, I think, and it's important to note that there is a boundary between um, the militias who march and the right-wing populace who increasingly identify as white. The last thing I would say is that this notion of being dispossessed corresponds with the international flavor of this on the right. The uh, French came up with the notion of le grand remplacement, the great replacement in the 70s and became increasingly articulated and was in France the notion that liberal elites and global liberal elites were going to displace the French population with immigrants, in, in this case from Africa and the Middle East. Um, but the idea of replacement is central not only 
uh, to European uh, far right, but also to this American far right. And it's especially severe in, um, in the uh, uh, militia right. So I will end with the, in 2017, there was a uh, very important, important to understand uh, demonstration in the, in the USA in Charlottesville, Virginia, which in, included um, a march, an even a nighttime march with torches by the militia right in the USA, which startled uh, American opinion. And one of their chants was, you will not replace us. The point being the correspondence between one, feeling dispossessed from your seat at the table and two, the, the uh, similarity with the similar movements abroad, all of which have adopted replacement theory.